those who are here for the first time, we certainly extend to you a hearty welcome. We do hope that you'll enjoy it and be glad to assemble with us more in the future. Brother Schroeder comes from Gilead to spend a few hours with us. He would be glad to talk to you. His subject will be Living a Life of Purpose. Brother Schroeder. Well, I'm very happy to be visiting you brothers here in Rosetta. You look as if you're continuing in the real happiness that counts nowadays and having a knowledge and understanding and vision of Jehovah God's purposes. You're all aware that, especially since 1926, we've been living in the times of happiness that uh, Daniel spoke of in the 12th chapter. And, of course, we're very glad that it's our generation that's living in this time when we're getting so much knowledge and understanding and vision and are living in paradise sake conditions, you might say, spiritually, to be living in these wonderful times. It's in this time that Jude, the Bible writer Jude says, that there would be some stars with no set course. In other words, there'd be some who would be wandering, that have no course, no program, no objective, and uh, wouldn't have a set goal toward which they would be operating. So the question arises, uh, how about us? We've been the truth for quite some number of years now. Are we uh, living really a life of purpose? Do we have a goal? Do we have a program? Do we have a set objective? And are we stars with a set course and not just without a set course? We know that our God, Jehovah, is the great God of purpose. He must have a set course. He has a program. He has an objective. And uh, if we are his servants, his witnesses, why, that means that we too, coming in harmony and in union with him, we must have a purpose. And if he lives a life of purpose, well, we too then should live a life of purpose. In our time now, we're getting a greater understanding of God's marvelous purposes. I heard a lecture a few weeks ago by Monsignor Sheen. Probably you know he's the outstanding spokesman in the United States for the Roman Catholic Church. His headquarters are in Washington, D.C. He's a professor at Georgetown University, and he's one of the advisors to the State Department of the United States government. Well, Monsignor Sheen was saying that uh, it's apparent that all peoples in the earth today are passing through a great crisis. And that in this great crisis, there is a polarization process going on. And what did he mean by this polarization process? Well, he explained that in this crisis, in this shakeup, uh, many peoples would be uh, shaken towards sort of the North Pole, which he sort of showed was the good people, and then the others would be shaken sort of toward the South Pole, which would be the bad people. So in this great crisis, read the scriptures, he's not aware of what uh, Jesus said in uh, Matthew, the 25th chapter, that in the last days when there would be this great crisis, this great shaking of the nations, he would come, not the Catholic Church, and not a, a crisis or a polarization process forced by the nations that would cause the dividing of the peoples, but Jesus would come with his angels and would there divide the peoples. And he doesn't say he's going to put them into two camps, Catholics and communists. But Jesus says they're going to be sheep and goats, does he not? And then he says in another place that all these sheep are going to be gathered together with a little flock into one fold and there'll be one shepherd. 
So we as Jehovah's Witnesses, of course, do not agree with Monsignor Sheen and his vision of God's purpose and the outworking of things in this time of crisis. We do agree that the crisis is here, but this is a time of crisis forced by Jesus Christ, which is going to result in the real division of the peoples between sheep and goats. Now, we've also, in these times of uh, vision of God's purpose, have come to realize and understand, and understand that this is the time now for all of us to change our family connections. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, we know that our old family head, Adam, gave us a lot of trouble, caused us a lot of trouble. He uh, rebelled against the Most High God and he brought great disability upon all of us. Sin, sickness, death. And uh, ever since Adam's time, the whole human family has been divorced from God, have they not? They have not been in any legal relationship with him. So that whole family of Adam has been cast off by God. Well, in due time, God produced a second Adam. It speaks, that is, Paul speaks of a second Adam in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. And who is that second Adam? That second Adam is Christ Jesus. And this second Adam now is the great shepherd. And he's building a new family. A new family of sheep. And since this second Adam is good, is perfect, is wholesome, is righteous, all those who come under his family connections are going to be in a place of safety. And they're going to inherit blessings and favor and legal recognition which come through the family head, Jesus Christ. So what does it mean? We've got to change from the old family of Adam, which is doomed and is going to be cut off, and change our family connections now to the second Adam, Christ Jesus, be in his family organization, in his sheepfold. And there's where we're going to find real safety and security. So therefore we, as God's people, who are going to live a life of purpose, a real uh, purpose that's going to count and get us places, we've got to build our life of purpose in connection with this new family, not the old family. That's gone. And that's doomed. And uh, it's uh, out of the picture altogether. There's an interesting prophecy in Psalm 107 that uh, I'd like to just briefly read. Verse 40, 41 and 42. He poureth contempt upon princes and causeth them to wander in the wilderness where there is no way. Yet setteth he the poor on high from affliction and maketh him families like a flock. The righteous shall see it and rejoice, and all iniquity shall stop her mouth. Now note here, in the commencement, he poureth contempt upon princes. This refers to the princes, the leaders, the rulers, the commanders, the head men of the old world society. And uh, it says he causes them to wander in the wilderness. In other words, they'd be in a fog. They wouldn't know where to go. They'd be confused. They'd be stars with no set course, not knowing where they're going. And isn't it true that we're in such a time of great world confusion when men's heart fail them for fear and when even great rulers, even though they may conscientiously think that they can do good, like Eisenhower, maybe others think they can, but after all is said and done, there's nothing much they can do to lead mankind out of this confused crisis and mess that we now find ourselves in. And, as it says, they will wander in the wilderness where there is no way. Now, we as Jehovah's Witnesses do not want to be stars with no set course like these men. And... Uh, we know that not only the political leaders are in this fog 
but the religious leaders are too. And uh, the Bible speaks of religious leaders as stars and how in the last days a third of the stars would be cast out of heaven and be thrown down to the earth. And these religious ministers today are earthly minded. They're no longer spiritually minded as they used to be. And uh, they're willing to do deals with the commercial and political parts of Satan's organization. And so they have no more vision of God's kingdom and hope of life in the new world. No, they are wandering and are stars without a course. Actually, they are stars following Satan just as well as that star that led the so-called wise men to Bethlehem as uh, the radio and the people have been talking so much about during the past few days in connection with paganized Christ uh, Christmas. As a matter of fact, I think all of us during this past Christmas season are aware of how paganized the so-called Christian people have become in this country. And it's getting worse every year, isn't it? And they're getting farther and farther away from the truth in the Bible and any desire to, you might say, be Christian. And many of the newspaper articles and uh, magazine articles, like in the Life magazine, actually admit that the whole Christmas idea and with its trimmings have uh, a pagan origin. Yet the people will knuckle under and embrace it and think it's wonderful and even though it costs them a lot of money and some of them complain about the Christmas idea being commercialized, yet they go along with the crowd not knowing where they're going and they're willing to follow the crowd. The, uh, red, the uh, Jordan River, you might say, that's ha fast following down toward the Dead Sea of Armageddon. Our so-called wise intellectuals, too, uh, don't know where they're going. The very fact that uh, they're all afraid of this atomic bomb and uh, some of your scientists that had something to do with the pre preparation of that atomic bomb are very fearful and not knowing what lies ahead of them if they ever start an atomic war. But even the young people who are being educated today don't really have a set goal, a set course either. And they're just wandering stars hoping that someday they might get a good job where they can earn ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 a year and, and have a good time and uh, live today and why worry about tomorrow. No idea of a future. We had uh, a couple, a couple uh, Cornell students visit uh, Gilead uh, a few Sundays ago at our Watchtower study, and I had a chance to talk to them for about two hours. And uh, they were very much interested in, um, in our organization and our school work. They were students of government. But uh, in talking with them, you could see how they were wandering. They really had no set course, uh, even though they were trying to get an education, but uh, no set plan as to how uh, mankind can be helped and to get out of this great crisis that we find ourselves in. Also, a few Saturdays ago, Brother Marcus and I were visiting in a company near uh, Ithaca, and uh, several, uh, the brother that we were visiting invited several men of goodwill with whom he had been having studies during the past several weeks. And there was one man there in that uh, little uh, informal gathering we had. We spent about four or five hours talking about the Bible that Saturday night. And this fellow was uh, a newspaper man. He was also a playwright. And he was sort of a, a small town philosopher too. And uh, he had been looking for a set course, you might say, for years and had apparently investigated several religions and had been up in politics and commerce and everything. And uh, he was fed up with all these things. And uh, he was so discouraged with life that uh, he thought, well, the best thing to do is drink and forget the present and live each day and not worry about the future. Well, of course, a few weeks ago, uh, this brother visited him and talked to him, left him some of our publications, and he began to read, and for some reason, uh, he had our books before, but he'd never, they never seemed to click with him before. But now they seem to, and having studies and 
having the brother answer his questions for him, why, he got his eyes open very quickly. And after this discussion we had that night, he said, well, this is it. I don't know how many times he said that. This is it. And he sort of uh, uh, had regrets at all these many years, and he was a man well along in years, and he hadn't had the opportunity to, to really see it. But uh, we made a mistake. We, the next morning, went out in the witness work, 10 o'clock, and uh, he called, he telephoned, just a few minutes before we went out, just to uh, ask what we were doing. Of course, we said we were just ready to go out in the witness work. And the way he talked, he, he was sorry that we hadn't asked him. He would like to have gone along in the witness work to just see how we do it from door to door. And we hadn't been alert enough to think that he had advanced that far to be given that invitation. Of course, he wasn't dressed and we couldn't wait for him. We were all ready to go out from that contact point. But uh, he's going to make the Yankee Stadium Convention. And these other men that were there, too, they were all new. One was a contractor and his wife. Another was uh, an official in the IBM. And these, all these fellows, uh, uh, young men, or middle-aged men, I mean, they uh, really were getting their eyes open and were seeing that up to that time, they had no set course, no goal, no objective, and they were fed up with the old world. But here was something now, this new world society, uh, where they saw God had a purpose and objective, and they were now eager to learn more about that and come along with us. It reminds me, I had a letter uh, this week from Italy, and uh, by one of the Gilead graduates who's in Italy. I should have brought the letter along with me. But I just remember this one experience that uh, this uh, Gilead graduate mentioned. She's only been there two months in Italy in this missionary work and she's in uh, Florence Florence is quite a cultural center in Italy and uh, the people apparently uh, are of a higher type but they're still blinded and uh, have real no knowledge of the truth but she met this uh, man and uh, with her limited knowledge of Italian she was able to witness to him and place the books with him and made one back call. And that fellow said, that young man and his wife, he said, you know, we've been communists, we've tried religion, and we're fed up with everything. Now, here, this makes sense. Why didn't you folks come before, years ago? And just now, we're getting our eyes open to this wonderful thing, this real organization of God that's really setting a purpose for us. So needless to say, it's brought great happiness to the missionary who's getting such a good start with this real interested man and his wife. Well, these are just examples of what's happening in many parts of the world today. The real thinking type of man and woman are now realizing that they have no purpose as far as the old world society is concerned, other than eat and drink today and why worry about tomorrow. Well, that's no real goal. That's fatalism, is it not? And we as men who really want to live, we want a goal. We want a purpose. Actually, you might say that 99% of the people today are wandering, are stars without a real set of course, a real set course. Now, what about you and I? Are we going to be like the vast majority of mankind just wander along aimlessly? Why worry about tomorrow and about our future relationship with God? Let's have a good time today and uh, make a success as most of the world considers that pleasure of success. Well, eating and drinking and merrymaking is a very narrow future and is a very narrow vision. We have to admit, however, there are some Jehovah's Witnesses who do have such a narrow view and really don't have a set course. We want to help those who don't have a real set goal to do something about it and to really now begin to live a life of purpose. And then there are some who think, well, we can coast along with Jehovah's Witnesses today. They're good people and uh, we'll help them a little bit and show goodwill. And then finally, we'll go right through Armageddon 
And then when we hit the new world after Armageddon, well, then we'll live uh, a wonderful life on a bed of roses, no more work, and we'll live forever. Well, that's no vision either. You and I know the Bible says that God works and Jesus works. And to work requires activity. And uh, if God is a God of purpose, that work that he does, that activity that he engages in, must have a set goal, a set objective. Well, if they work, we can rest assured that we're going to work in the new world too. It's not going to be just all ease and no work. But we'll be living a time in a, in a work, we'll doing, be doing a work then, and we'll have a further purpose of existence. And that'll be wonderful. But we'll all be making our contribution then to the new world. But does that mean that now in this pre-Armageddon period uh, there is no set goal or course or objective for us? On the other hand, there really is a great program that we are required to line up with today. And this is really a sheep program. As I just mentioned before at the beginning, we're establishing new family connections with the new society. Jesus Christ is the head of this. He's the great father and leader. And we've got to become children of that organization and follow our leader, our shepherd, this great everlasting father, Jesus Christ. You know, some people say, well, uh, I know God. His name is Jehovah. I read it in the Bible. It's, it's here. But is that knowing God, just uh, reading it in the Bible, reading it in the book? Now, when you, as persons in this audience, when you say that you know a person, what does that mean? That means that you've had a relationship with him for a long time. You've not just met him casually. That would be just a casual acquaintance, wouldn't it? To shake hands for the first time. Brother and sister, Brother Smith meeting Sister Brown and so on. That's only an acquaintance. But to know each other means to have had dealings for a long time. And to each side test the other. Because friends have the right to test each other to know where they stand and how far they can go. Well now, we in this new world society... We're becoming friends of Jehovah and friends of this great uh, everlasting Father, Jesus Christ. Now, we've got to know them. And it, it's not just a matter of knowing them by name, but it's to have relationship with them, experiences in their work, in their organization, and uh, lining up with their purposes. And this takes time, just like amongst human relationships. It may take years to build up friendships and to really get to know each other. And the same is true in knowing God and in knowing Jesus Christ. Well now, in your life of purpose, are you beginning to establish such a wonderful friendship with God and Jesus Christ? Well, it's worth considering. Now I have, uh, I'd like to uh, suggest a five-point program, a sheep program, I've got it called here, to uh, uh, keep developing this uh, intimate relationship with the Most High God, who is a God of purpose. And if we do that, we're going to live a life of purpose, because he lives a life of purpose, and our relationship with him then will result in our living a life of purpose. Well, the first point on this program is the personal aspect. In other words, as a sheep now, whether you're of the little flock or the other sheep, we're all sheep. We've got to daily feed. Now, sheep feed. As you watch the sheep on Kingdom Farm there, they're always feeding. They always got their head down to the grass and uh, going along and feeding, feeding, feeding. That's one of their major occupations. Well, uh, we as sheep have got to feed. Now, I don't mean by feeding on physical food, but we've got to feed on spiritual food. You can't feed just once a week, once a month. No, our sheep program requires a daily feeding. Now, in this daily feeding, what better can we do than to start with the day's text and comments? We have the New Year book. 
Let's set that program, that start every day. But now that isn't all. Sometime time during the day we should do more. And uh, there are several ways you can do that. I know all of you are busy, some have secular work, homework, taking care of children, some go to school. But you should rise above that and even make a further effort to feed. And the source of spiritual food, of course, is the Bible. Now, uh, you can do that by Bible reading, looking up Bible prophecies, little Bible problems, little questions that come through your mind. Check it up with the society's publications. Or maybe questions that have been asked you in the field. Go home and spend five or ten minutes checking up. See if we can get the answer to that little problem. Whatever that little Bible problem may be. But just working out that little Bible problem and trying to get the answer is also working as a spiritual feeding process to you. Then also, we ought to talk about the Bible with the brothers that we meet or if we talk to friends and associates or in our witness work. The mere fact that we're talking on the Bible, you'd be surprised. It sets the wheels of your mind operating and uh, that uh, brings about a feeding, a recording. We had a very interesting illustration given to Gilead recently. You know that uh, our brain has two parts, the front part and the back part of the brain. Well, the front part of the brain, uh, when we're born as a little child, has uh, impressions already made on that brain. And these are little electrical circuits. And um, but God puts those circuits in before we're born so that uh, this uh, front part of the brain can involuntarily operate any part of our body. I mean, all the involuntary operations of the heart and, and the digestive system, that's all done by these electrical circuits already put in our brain. And it automatically takes place and so on. But do you know, the back part of the brain is a perfect blank when we're born. And this requires new electrical circuits to be put in. And how do you put those electrical circuits in? Well, you put them in by things you see, by things you hear, by things you taste, by things you touch, by using your five senses. And uh, uh, scientists have already experimented. They can take a little electric current and put it in a certain part of your brain, that is this back part of the brain, and uh, you think you smell something or you think you hear a bell ringing. But there was no bell ringing, but that particular circuit was uh, touched by this little electrical spark and it will produce that sensation, that uh, effect in your mind. So, when the Apostle Paul said that we should renew our mind, he knew what he was talking about. He knew that these little electrical circuits or impressions that we have in our brain uh, can be strengthened or can be uh, uh, put in the background until finally they're so weak that they never come to the fore again. So that's why uh, many of us, before we got knowledge of the truth, we were in the old world society. We were full of devil religion, were we not? And all kinds of nonsense, including Christmas and whatnot. Well, all those experiences that we had uh, has built up all kinds of electrical circuits in our in our brain, those impressions are there. You still can remember them. But the time has now come through a, a feeding program, a personal feeding program based on the Bible, new world living and new world thoughts. You're creating new circuits and these old impressions are being put in the background. And you can't do that overnight. It takes years of study. So to be really a sheep, you've got to start building new circuits. And forget the old circuits. Get them out of your mind as fast as possible. It'll take years. Another thing that's been found, the more you think about a, a subject, a particular point, the greater is that circuit in your brain. I mean, it's an impression there. It's so strong that you can remember it. And that's why we keep repeating. And that's why the Bible has so many prophecies to drive home certain points. Why? That we as God's servants, as sheep, will have strong electrical circuits on those points implanted in our mind. They'll be so strong that our faith will be so strong that when Armageddon comes, we'll hold fast to Jehovah God and to the organization as it goes on through, just like the Ark of Noah went right on through the flood in Noah's time. 
So this feeding program, brothers, is vital. It's important. It's part of the changing over of our minds. I can't do it for you. You can't do it for me. Each one of us has to set to that task ourselves. But it's a daily program. The second part of the program is private association. Thank Jehovah God that we don't have to go it alone in these terrible times. God didn't just call John Brown, Tom Smith, miles apart, each by themselves to get a knowledge of the truth and live by themselves and eventually make the new world. Oh, no. Now, remember what the prophecy says here, the next verse in Psalm 107. Yet setteth he the poor, the meek, on high from affliction, and maketh him families like a flock. How true that is. Like the New Year book shows that there are nearly 14,000 congregations of Jehovah's Witnesses all over the earth in 127 countries. And each congregation is a little family, like it says here, families like a flock. So there are really 14,000 families, you might say, all over the world, all uh, little organized units of God's great organization. And we as sheep, and like you see again, sheep uh, at Kingdom Farm or at any other farmer's place, you don't find one sheep in uh, wandering all by himself. That is, uh, that's his his objective and his course. Oh no, sheep always work together in flocks, don't they? And uh, when many of them, most of them want to go this way, they all go that way. When the others go that way, they all go that way. They all work together. Well, the same is with us. We're sheep and we want to work together. We want to live together. We want to associate together. So that's the second part of our program that uh, we want to build and develop in this wonderful association. So that means we've got to put into practice principles of association and working with our neighbor. Our real neighbor is our fellow witness of Jehovah. The Bible now is full of Christian conduct, Christian principles, love, keeping the organization clean and so on. These things we've got to now apply. We've got to take them seriously. In our little flock and family like you have here, there should be no cliques, no uh, uh, class distinction. We're all sheep. Whether of the little flock or the other sheep makes no difference. We should all be one happy, contented, well-fed, peaceful, united family. Now, like we do at Gilead, uh, we right away encourage all the students when they come in to get to know the names of all their fellow students. Not only that, to get to know the names of the 55 members of the farm family. We know that as soon as they get to know each other by name, first the last name, brother and sister so-and-so we call them, then eventually we get to know them by the first name, and then we use the first name. We know that as soon as a student gets to know the names of all the other 170 in the household, it immediately builds the family idea. And uh, you, you get to know each other more. You started with acquaintance, and then you have little experiences together, and uh, uh, rejoice in this and that, and discuss Bible topics and so on. And before you know it, in the course of the weeks, we have a wonderfully well-knit family. So much so that the students cry when they have to leave. And they say that Gilead becomes their home more than even their home where they were brought up. And that's all done by close association. Well, now, if we can do that there, why cannot this be done in every congregation? And personally, it seems to me it can. And I think one of the first things that should be done, each one of you should know everyone else by their first name. Even their children you should know by their first name. They're all part of this one big family here. And then uh, go out of your way sometimes to see them and do little kindnesses, little acts of good. If one is not well, phone them up or maybe visit them and so on. That's all part of the one big happy family. And the more you go out of your way to do good to your brothers, the happier you will be. So 
daily we should uh, realize we're members of a family. And let's show that affection, that interest, that love, that well-being for others. Now, the third part of our program is to realize that we have organization responsibilities. Jehovah God has an organization, always has had an organization. An organization is an orderly arrangement of creatures to brought together for a purpose. So that means everyone in an organization has got to have a purpose, a goal, a set objective, and work accordingly. Otherwise, you have disharmony, disorganization. But here, God has an organization that's in harmony, orderly. Everybody has a purpose and works. Now, Jesus said, uh, the last days are going to be like the days of Noah. In Noah's time, was there a little organization? Was there an ark that they went into and received uh, protection? Yes. Today, uh, in order to receive protection, can you get this just by your walking your own way? Or must you be with God's organization and go into the ark, the one organization, the one system of things, and be carried through? Well, the answer is simple. The Bible is very clear. You've got to be in the flock. You've got to be of that family. You've got to be in that ark. You've got to be in that system of things, that new system of things. If you're not in there, you're out of luck. Because God doesn't have several organizations, several avenues, several ways. There's just the one straight and narrow way. So in other words, all of us have organizational responsibilities. We have to get organizational experience. And the more experience we have in working with an organization, that is God's organization, the stronger we will be, the greater will be our faith. Now, God's organization on the earth today is made up of 14,000 congregations, all under the Watchtower Bible Society. And uh, each organization has its servants. Now, whenever God's organization meets, why, that means we who are part of God's organization, we should be there too. Now, God's organization, for instance, represented by this little congregation here, meets two or three times a week. Every time you have your service meeting is the time when the Lord's organization meets. It's an official organizational meeting. And if you're part of that flock, you should be there. If you're not, you're showing disrespect for God's organization. You're taking your, your association lightly. Now, the only way you can get organizational experience and organizational guidance is only by being here every time there's a service meeting, every time there's a watchtower study, because God's organization meets here at this hall those two times a week. And we cannot afford any loose connections with God's organization. Why, uh, uh, Noah's sons didn't just pop outside the ark. They stayed inside the ark, didn't they? Well, we've got to stay inside the organization if we're going to receive protection. So the thing to do is to build and have that strong experience, organizational experience, with God's house. Another thing, whenever there's a circuit assembly, that's when God's organization in these several counties meets. We should be there for the two or three days. And when there's a big international assembly like there's going to be in New York, Yankee Stadium, this year, in July 19th, why, well, we should be there. That's God's organization meeting. Every one of us, 100% should be there. Not just for one or two days. Let's get there for the whole eight days. This is a theocratic festival. God had festivals for the typical theocratic organization of Israel. They met three times a year in Jerusalem. Everybody went. And they had a wonderful time. They had organizational experience. And organizationally, they gave praise to God. So we too today should stay close to God's organization have that organizational experience, and that's only done here in the local congregation and then meeting at the assemblies and conventions. So let's keep that in mind. That's part of our program. That's having a, a set life of purpose. Next, number four, war duties. We're living in a time of war. No, we're not on the Korean front. But you know we're on the theocratic Christian front today. 
And that Christian front isn't just in one country. The Christian war front is in every country of the earth. Just read it in the yearbook. As Christians, we're soldiers of Jesus Christ. And uh, we're fighting against the, the in invisible demons, are we not? The principal, uh, principalities and powers of darkness. And we've got to be on war duty. As soon as you become a Christian, dedicate your life, setting that goal of purpose of being one of God's sheep, you're called immediately to war duty. This is not a time of peace. God has declared war against the old society, the old Adamic system of things. That's going down. It's doomed. When Armageddon comes, it'll just wash it away. But we of the New World Society have declared war against it. And we're expected to do something about it. So our war duties are an important part of our present purpose. Well, now, what are these war duties? Well, our preaching work. We're expected to share in every part of the preaching work. House-to-house -house field service, backhaul work, Bible study work, street work. Let's get out there and dedicate so much time every month to war duties. I think this is something where many brothers fail. They just wander without a set course. Well, I'll put in five hours of this month. Next month, if I feel a little better, I'll do seven hours. Next month, if I don't feel well, well, maybe I won't put any hours in the service. That's not a way a soldier fights. We have a set war. The thing is getting hotter. It's not a cold war. And we've got to get out there and have a set program. And if you have the physical strength and you can contribute 10 hours a month of war duty, get those 10 hours a month every month in the field service. If you can com uh, contribute 15 hours or 20 hours, get out there and make that contribution of war work. Now, pioneers, some of them are specials, 150 hours, 140 hours, and the other ordinary general pioneers put in 100 hours a month. They have a set goal. The society makes the goal for them, and they fight to contribute that and maintain it. Well, now, if they have such a set goal and set course, why can't you, as company publishers, set yourself such a specific quota of war work, war duty? I know I personally try to do that myself. Over and above all my other work, I like to get so much time in the field service every month. I like to think that I have been one of the 456,000 publishers all around the world that has been upholding the supremacy the sovereign supremacy of the Most High God. And the only way that can be done is preaching from house to house, whoever we are, and uh, the other phases of the work. So let's get out there, brothers, and uh, do something about it. Let's be on the war front, on the Christian war front. And finally, let's be a true shining star. Not one of these mimic stars that have no set course. Let's be a real theocratic star. And uh, let's not hide our light under a bushel, but let's get out there and let our light shine as a real reflector of God. And the more we let shine the joys, the theocratic health that we have, the uh, rejoicing in association in a wonderfully clean, progressive theocratic organization, the greater is going to be the reflecting of this light of our star. So radiate that. Be charged with right thinking. On this point, to illustrate, uh, we had a lecture given at Gilead a few weeks ago by an eminent uh, surgeon. He's a brother. He's been the truth many years now. And he's retired uh, from the uh, medical profession. But uh, Brother Knorr asked him to give a lecture to the students on uh, general health. And he said something that really uh, set me thinking, and uh, which I personally like to keep in mind. In his introduction, he said, you know, you pioneers ought to be the healthiest people there are. He said, we physicians know that uh, an extrovert, one who always gives, 
is better physically and in, in health in every way than one who's an introvert, who always keeps to himself. Now he says, you pioneers are out given every day. And that's wonderful. And uh, you're using all your forces that God's given you in your organism. You're using these. And that's good for you. So he said, it's always better to be an extrovert than an introvert. So I'd like to pass on that thought to you too. So in being a shining star, a real witness of Jehovah God, where you're really radiating, you're always giving. And it's more happier to give, or it's, it, there's more happiness in giving than there is in receiving. I like a lot of selfish people. They like to learn and keep everything to themselves. They're stingy and so on, and they become grouchy, unreasonable. But a real theocratic sheep, he's always giving. And he's really and truly physically and mentally an extrovert. So let's uh, do that and be really a living light. Now, the prophecy in conclusion says, the righteous shall see it. Are we seeing the wandering aimlessness of the old world society, their leaders and their people? We certainly are. And we, the righteous, shall see it. We that are being gathered together in these flocks like sheep. The righteous shall see it and rejoice. Where is the real happiness today and the real joy? It's in God's house in God's organization. Just read the yearbook and you'll see that evidence. And then notice it finally says in this prophecy, and all iniquity shall stop her mouth. Brother Noor is in Africa and uh, as you know, throughout Africa now there's a ra wave of anti-British and anti-European feeling, race uh, striving between the whites and the blacks. And of course, Jehovah's Witnesses are being caught in between. And Brother Nor tried to attend a large convention of Jehovah's Witnesses in the Gold Coast, that's West Africa, in the latter part of November. And the British government refused him entry. So, this was a great disappointment in a way to the brothers. They had raised, uh, arranged a wonderfully, uh, the largest national convention of colored brothers in West Africa. And they have a few Gileadites there, and of course the Gileadites were trying to show them how to get ready for this great convention. So weeks ahead of time, they, uh, they couldn't find a hall big enough in Accra, that's the capital city. So the brothers had to build themselves their own assembly hall, a great booth made up of branches. And this big uh, assembly hall was to cover 52,000 square feet. And so the brothers were building this weeks ahead of time, and a lot of the people and the government officers would come around and check to see what was going on. The army was cooperating with the electrical company to supply the lighting and to floodlight the large sign on top of the front booth. The local contractor donated over a thousand feet of pipe so the water company could supply water to the kitchen. The whole face of this semi-desert polo ground was being changed into a thriving little town. Europeans and Africans drove around the structures at night and asked so many questions. Why we would go to so much work for just a short assembly they could not understand. All during the assembly, Europeans inspected the goings-on, and those we could contact, we escorted through the various departments. Many were the expressions of amazement at the efficiency of the organization. Mr. Megby, a very prominent and well-known member of the Convention People's Party, the political party holding the reins of the government, said, this is the only organization I've seen that has beaten his party as far as organization is concerned. A good world person said there was a large ceremonial gathering in Accra when King Prempe visited the city. But, he exclaimed, it was nothing like this organized arrangement. So the brothers were getting ready on a far greater scale than even to receive the local African king. Well, they went on, and uh, two years ago when they had the convention, well, they only had 3,000 attending. 
But with this convention, the first day they had 6,000 and all brothers. And they were all wearing these lapels like they did in London Convention and as we did in Washington. And they immersed 690 at this convention. And that inspired the fact that they had been immersing right along at the circuit assemblies. And then delegates arrived as the days went on. The second day, there were 6,500 present. And uh, so finally, on the Sunday, there were 8,000 present. Now, these are all publishers. So now, what about the public meeting? Well, a public meeting that finally was held. And remember, two years ago, they only had 3,000 at the public meeting. Now, here they had 15,000 turned out. People were everywhere. All the sitting and standing room was taken. Trucks drove up around the sides of the booth, and in seconds they were full of people seeking a place to see and hear the speakers. We had a special chair section for officials and dignitaries of the government whom we sent letters and invitation to as well as a press section and everything was full. You can well imagine, imagine the feeling that came over that vast audience when it was announced that Brother, Brother, Brother Nor was prevented by the government from visiting this country and delivering the public talk. Newspapers took up the story immediately. And so there's a great public clamor now in that country, and the colored people are calling for the British government to retract and to make an official invitation to Brother Nor to visit their country in February. But we don't know whether the British government will do that. But anyway, it's causing many people to take their stand. And as this brother says, this Gilead brother, the very next week after convention, and they have four units in this city, last weekend our kingdom halls of the four Accra units were packed out to overflowing. People were standing in great numbers at doors and windows. Several goodwill people took magazines and said they would join the brothers in the street work. The people in general do not like this action by government, and they are willing to show it. So here again is an example where the... Iniquity, as it says in the, prophe in the prophecy, shall stop her mouth. The victory always goes to Jehovah's people. Now, I think you also are aware that Brother Covington and Brother Howe in Canada have been uh, arguing a world-famous case in Canada, and they just finished it two weeks ago, and the issue is on sedition. Now, this is very vital, for if the Supreme Court of Canada should find us guilty of sedition. Why, if during another war, here or wherever else it may be in the world, very easily the countries could say, well, you're against the interests of the government. Look what they found in Canada. They found you were seditious. If you're seditious in Canada, you must be seditious in this country. Therefore, we close you down. And I think all of you read the newspapers the other day how in France, They've now banned the Watchtower, or in France, but throughout the French territory. Well, anyway, in Canada, this Supreme Court case was argued not one day, not two days, but seven days. And the case, uh, the uh, precedent, the nearest precedent the brothers could find was a case that occurred in England in the year 1383. Because you remember Canada is part of the British Commonwealth of Nations. And so the society's lawyers said, Mr. Howe told court the case was similar to the heresy proceedings against John Wycliffe in the year 1383. Mr. Howe recalled that Wycliffe was charged for teaching it is lawful for any man, either deacon or priest, to preach the word of God without the authority or license of the apostolic see or any other of his Catholics. Mr. Howe added, a statute was passed in those days to deal with, with Wycliffe and his poor preachers who engaged in a missionary work similar to that of Jehovah's Witnesses today. The city of Quebec is asking the Supreme Court of this democratic and in the enlightened year of 1952 to listen with approval to the same arguments presented to the, at the heresy tribunals of the Middle Ages in England. Mr. Howe went on. It comes as something of a shock to think that the contentions addressed to this tribunal today are the same arguments which were presented in the heresy trial of John Wycliffe more than five and a half centuries ago. The respondents, Quebec City, are trying to turn the clock back 
and stampede the court into a heresy hunt to destroy the liberties of the people and push Canada back into the Middle Ages, Mr. Howe declared. An effort was made to get Brother Covington to be given permission to speak before the Supreme Court, but, of course, they turned it down. They said that this was for the Canadians to decide. There are nine members of the Supreme Court, and some of them are Catholics and some of them are Protestants on the Supreme Court. And the Chief Justice is a Catholic, a French Catholic. This uh, is interesting. Mr. Howe said the beliefs of the witnesses were based on the Bible. They believed in a supreme being, but they differed from other religions in that they looked forward to the establishment of God's kingdom on earth rather than in the heavens. Mr. Justice Rand, who is an associate justice, asked if the witnesses observe Sunday. Mr. Howe said the witnesses take the position that every day in is a day of equal responsibility to the Creator. The religious services of the witnesses consisted of hymns and prayers and lectures on the Bible. The witnesses believed it was their duty to spread the gospel. For that reason, they went from house to house distributing tracts containing sermons on sections in the Bible. It was the distribution of such tracts that led to the present case. Then uh, Brother proceeded to show that we believe that God's law is higher than man's law, and when God's law says we should preach, we go ahead to preach. Then the third day, an interesting thing happened. The chief justice being a Catholic, Mr. Rand, another justice, is a Protestant. And they got so heated about this that the two justices fought between themselves right on the Supreme Bench. <laughs> there was a drama to the clash. For the chief justice, a Roman Catholic, has led the attack in the court on the arguments by Glenn Howe, counsel for Jehovah's Witnesses, against Mr. Justice Rand, a Protestant. It happened when the Chief Justice had asked Mr. Howe a question that he had seemed to have answered throughout most of his first day's argument. Mr. Rand interrupted as Mr. Howe started to repeat his earlier answers. And then the Chief Justice heatedly snapped, We want your, Mr. Howe's answer, not that of another member of this court. So these brothers of justice aren't too peaceful. Then the opposition, of course, had to have their day in court. And here's the headline. Witnesses antisocial. A Quebec lawyer today argued in the Supreme Court of Canada that witnesses of Jehovah are anti-religious and antisocial. Ernest Godbu, counsel for the city of Quebec, said the witnesses criticize all religions. They claim they are the chosen ones of Christ and that their duty is to destroy governments by force. Just think, we're doing it by force. <laughs> Mr. Godbout presented his arguments in French during the fifth day of a hearing on the validity of the city of Quebec by law. Then um, Mr. Godbout said the witnesses preached Religious and Civil Revolution. From a book distributed by the witnesses, he quoted a statement that the witnesses do not constitute a religion. What can be more categorical than that, asked Chief Justice Rinfred. Here's an organization that is asking us to declare that it is a religious organization, and in its own books it states that it is not a religion. Mr. Godbu said one of the witnesses' books described religion as the cause of world destruction. Another described religion as the invention of Satan. One book, and this is the enemy's book he had in court, one book contains a picture of a nude woman being tortured in front of monks and nuns. It was entitled Roman Catholic Inquisition. Well, he's not wholly true there, but anyway, he pointed the picture in the enemy's book where it mentions the, uh, the harlot of Revelation, the 17th chapter, and how that refers to religion, organized religion. And the interesting thing is, uh, there was a recess just at that moment, and uh, uh, half an hour later, when the court was to, re uh, to re-sit again, Brother Howe, the society's lawyer, went out and got a, um, a Webster's Unabridged Dictionary, one of these great big thick ones. And he said, Your Honor, before the court goes on, I'd like to present to you what uh, Webster 
Noah Webster has to say about a whore. So he reads what it says about the whore, and uh, in Webster's Dictionary it says that it's a um, symbolic representation of the Roman Catholic Church. (laughs) So he said, if you're going to ban the witnesses of Jehovah for making that statement, their publications, you'll have to ban, uh, ban the distribution of Webster's Dictionary, which was written over 100 years ago. So that was a hot one. Then, another final clipping here. So you see the opposition is trying to make it very hot for us, and of course, they get their fingers burned every time. Counsel for the Quebec Attorney General's Department said yesterday in the Supreme Court of Canada that certain practices of the Witnesses of Jehovah are inconsistent with peace and safety. Emery Bolu of Montreal said some of the practices of the Witnesses constitute an excess of liberty. These practices made them exceptions to provisions of the Freedom of Worship statute. Mr. Bolu referred particularly to the Witnesses' practice of distributing Bible tracts in the streets. These tracts could contain statements that were offensive to the majority of the people in Quebec. And so for that reason, he presses the court to find us guilty of seditious libel. So, brothers, just as the uh, prophecy concludes, all iniquity shall stop her mouth. In the courts of this country, too, Jehovah's Witnesses have been given the victory, and our enemies have had their mouths stopped. And it may very well be that In Canada, too, the court will finally probably rule in our favor and the mouths of the Catholic Church in Canada, that is in Quebec, will be stopped, too. So, brothers, we're living in happy times. So let's set before us a real objective, a real goal, to live a life of purpose, and to live that life of purpose now, and realize that we're on a war front, and let's live a life full of theocratic warfare, and set before us a program of healthy, spiritual, theocratic living. And if we are successful now in living this life of war purpose, we'll have the wonderful privilege of passing on through Armageddon and living on into the new world where we'll live a glorious life of purpose and of wonderful works in a paradise-sake new world forever to the praise of God's name.